Welcome to Wake Forest University's 2018 Founders Day Convocation. As a courtesy to others, please turn off audible cell phones and other devices. To mark this joyous ceremony, we ask that you remain seated during both the processional and the recessional. Again, welcome. You may be seated. And please join me for our invocation, honoring the diversity of our spiritual heritages and the unity of our human condition. I invite you silently to call upon what is highest and deepest by the name you hold sacred and dear. Spirit of life and love, mover of the compassionate heart and human mind, melder of community, let us be. Let us be together. Let us be together in love, in respect, in honor, in appreciation, in wonder, in joy. Let us be together in harmony, 
Let us be together in unity with peace, with hope, with charity, with compassion, with justice, with mercy. Let us be together with gladness for all that makes us human, striving to be and become more than we are, to become more vulnerable, more merciful, justice-seeking, and kind. Fill us with the spirit of our founders, those named and unnamed, whose historic and living vision we still seek, whose challenge yet invites us to greater wisdom, and whose remembrance draws us again toward a deeper union, a union woven through choice and intent, through time and attention, through respect and compassion, until we recognize that we have become a whole cloth, a cloth made rich in texture and vibrant through our differences. May this gathering be a reflection of the generosity of the spirit that resides in each of our hearts. And may our greatest passion be compassion and our greatest strength be love. O oh, guardian of galaxies, creator of the cosmos, and stars beyond counting, so may it be. Amen. Shalom. Salam. Good afternoon, and welcome to Founders Day. It is our tradition on this day we gather as a community to remember our past and our early leaders who, whose devotion to the ideals of Wake Forest laid a strong foundation for this institution. Because of the work of those who came before us and the work now being done, our university is characterized by devotion to learning and to educating young people whose lives will make a difference in the professions and in society. We are a place with a strong sense of community, an appetite for inquiry and creativity, a penchant for exploring our passions, and a hunger for helping the world. As we remember our past, we are also here to recognize our faculty and honor the members of the class of 2018. Wake Forest is blessed with an outstanding and tremendously committed faculty. Today, we wish to honor several faculty members who have distinguished themselves in the areas of teaching, research, and service. We also have a long tradition of cultivating the imagination and nurturing critical thinking. And today, we will hear from three seniors who, de who demonstrate those qualities in their senior orations. As they reflect on their time on this campus and the ways education has led them to discovery, we continue a Wake Forest tradition of, ora of oration that is well over a century old. And on this day, when we celebrate the leaders who made our institution better, we will bestow the Medallion of Merit, Wake Forest's most distinguished honor, upon one individual who contributed his life to improving the student experience, upholding upholding our values and emboldening us to move forward in the spirit of pro humanitate. Thank you for being here today and as we honor our past, celebrate our present and look forward to our future. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Tony Marsh, Associate Dean of the College. Exceptional public speakers, orators, have been celebrated figures since ancient Greece, when lectures and performances in the Agora were the principal form of mass communication, as well as a principal literary form of the time. Orators remain celebrated figures in our contemporary culture too. Just think of those amazing TED speakers whose talks can mesmerize us with their gift of words and knowledge. Speaking of TED, let me take this opportunity to plug our own Wake Forest TEDx event. You might have noticed the X's out on the quad, which will be happening this Saturday afternoon right here in Wake Chapel. 
The art of the spoken word has long been a critical component of a classical or liberal arts education. The more educated the person, the stronger the rhetorical training one received. This is no surprise to us. We all know that the art of the spoken word is as necessary today as it was several thousand years ago. So let me ask you this, students. Raise your hand if you've taken a public speaking class at Wake Forest or made a formal presentation in any of your classes. Good, lots of hands. And how many of you anticipate that sometime in the not too dis distant future you will be giving oral presentations or speeches in your own classroom or in the public or private sector or perhaps even during a political campaign, all places where words and the way they are delivered matter. So clearly you get it, developing excellent communication skills are at the core of a liberal arts education. All of you in the audience and our three orators are about to become part of a 184-year-old Wake Forest tradition of senior orations. Think about that for a minute. Wake Forest students have been giving orations since long before the American Civil War for more than nine generations. In 1834, Wake Forest's first year, the school enrolled just 16 students, all who happened to be young men. They organized a debate society that first year and then the next year they organized another one so that they could have competing debate societies. To this day, we take debate very seriously at Wake Forest. These two groups were called the Eusalian and Philomathesian Literary Societies, and for many years they challenged each other to see which one could give the most erudite and persuasive speeches, and the winners were celebrated for their skills. In fact, so important was public speaking as part of a Wake Forest education that for almost 50 years, all seniors were required to give a public speech in front of the entire school in order to graduate unless excused by the faculty. I expect that didn't happen too frequently, the excuse. Aren't you glad that times and graduation requirements have changed, seniors? We've long since turned this venerable rite of passage into a voluntary one. This year, 35 essays were submitted by students who were nominated, nominated by faculty mentors. A panel of faculty read all the essays and selected 10 that were presented before a public audience of students, faculty, parents and friends last Wednesday in Pew Auditorium. Faculty judges who were in the audience chose the three orations you will hear this afternoon. So for nearly two centuries, the Wake Forest community has had the opportunity to listen to and learn from our gifted senior orators, and today will be no exception. So let me now introduce our three orators who will speak in alphabetical order. They are Rose O'Brien. Rose is from Winston-Salem. She's majoring in politics and international affairs with a minor in Italian language and culture. After graduation, Rose plans to work for a few years before pursuing a graduate degree in a field related to refugee and humanitarian crises. Her oration is titled, The Value of Self-Awareness. Carl Tadich, Kyle is from Charlotte. He's double majoring in economics and politics and international affairs with a minor in Spanish. Kyle's plans after graduation, and I just checked with him, are STBD, still to be determined. <laughs> His oration is titled, Learning the Essence of Wake Forest. And our final orator is Alison Thompson. Alison's hometown is Newport, Rhode Island. She is majoring in communication and following graduation, Alison plans to move to Italy and work in a bookstore. And her oration title is Life Doesn't Frighten Me. Please welcome Rose. Just over two years ago, I began teaching English to adults who came to the United States as refugees. And although I have taught hundreds of classes over the past two years, there's one particular classroom experience that I always look back at and remember with a laugh. It was a Friday morning in the downtown offices of Refugee Resettlement in Winston-Salem, and I had been teaching for about a year. The night before, I had stayed up too late watching Netflix, and my lesson plan resembled that, or reflected that. I had copy-pasted clip art and completely irrelevant vocabulary, and my students blew through the lesson plan in 20 painful minutes. 
After that, I decided to switch to teaching the conditional. I prompted each student by saying, if I were, then I would, and making lots of crazy nondescript hand motions. Most people were completely lost, although there was one student who followed and offered this perfectly correct response. If I were teaching, then I would do a better job than you. <laughs> In the moment, all I could say was, why, yes, that's correct. <laughs> That class reminded me of one of life's most important lessons, and a lesson I have struggled to maintain in contact with during my time here at Wake Forest, and that is the importance of humility. Without humility, we are cheating ourselves from an accurate view of reality. Humility is the reminder that we did not get where we are all by ourselves. It is not a lack of self-esteem. No, it's simply a modest view of oneself. This is a difficult concept to accept, especially in the United States. Our provost, Dr. Rogan Kirsch, will be the first to tell you that amongst young Americans, especially millennials, we are prone to inflated self-confidence. We are each important to those that love us, but the fact remains that we are not the most important. In fact, scientists tell us that the universe is constantly expanding in every direction, which means that there is no center of the universe, which also means we are not it. Sometimes we are a small part of the larger story in someone else's life. To illustrate this, I'd like to tell you the story of a very educated woman who also happens to be a refugee from Syria. This woman was once a young girl growing up in urban Syria who studied late into the night and made sure she was at the top of her graduating class. At 19, when a local man asked for her hand in marriage, she said, yes, only if I can go to university, get my PhD, study abroad, and become a professor. She did go on to study German literature abroad, get a PhD in business management, and become a successful professor. Unfortunately, her entire life was changed in one year when she received three tragic pieces of news. Her husband had been killed in a car crash, war had broken out in Syria, and she was pregnant with her first child. Over the course of the next eight years, she struggled to escape Syria with her family. Although she had previously earned a PhD, like so many of you in the audience, in her new country, she worked at a fast food restaurant. Nonetheless, she was early to every language lesson offered and was able to support her mother, her father, and her two brothers who had come with her. This incredible woman shares something in common with all of you in the audience. She lived in Winston-Salem. Her story of triumph and tragedy brought her here to Winston-Salem and even on Wake Forest campus and into my English classes. Her example, for me, has been one of the greatest stories of humility and determination that I have encountered in my time at Wake Forest. I would never have known her stories unless I had read about them on the Humans of New York Facebook page. Before she even arrived in Winston-Salem, she was interviewed by Brandon Stanton, who's the photographer of that page. In the interview, she said that no matter where she went, no matter where she landed, what city, what country, she would learn the local language and get her PhD again. We were all a small part of what is the incredible tale of this woman's life. There's so many people whose stories are never known, unlike many of us that are commended daily. Even now, approximately 4,673 miles away, there's someone who, in many ways, is like me. We have both studied Italian, although it's my second and his fourth language. We're both terrible swimmers, and we enjoy the books of Raul Dahl and our tea with three lumps of sugar. That man's name is Abdulaziz Kandurani. He's a 20-year-old Afghan man, and we met while I was in Italy studying as part of a Richter Research Scholarship with the Italian department. Aziz, the oldest brother of five siblings, was sent to Europe to look for a job at the tender age of 14. He proceeded to walk 4,000 miles from Jalalabad, Afghanistan, to Trieste, Italy, where I met him. The set of circumstances that surrounded our birth labeled him as an immigrant in Italy while I was an expat. He's no less intelligent or hardworking than I am, but life has led us in two vastly different directions. In the course of our two-year friendship, I have often wished that he could come to Wake Forest and be a student here, as I am. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, who would do just as well if they were placed in our seats. There are students who would give better speeches than this one, and there are certainly teachers who would teach the conditional better than I do, and I think the audience today is full of them. So, how does that message relate to us here at Wake Forest? I grew up in Winston-Salem, so Wake Forest is close to my heart. Before Wake Forest was my alma mater, I knew her fight songs, and I went to the tailgates every weekend in my old golden black. As I matriculated, our relationship matured, as the relationship between father and mother, as the mother and child does. 
I no longer saw Wake Forest in blind adoration, but I accepted her faults and mistakes as human mistakes made by a human institution. Wake Forest has room to grow, and I believe humility should be at the center of that growth. It was Mahatma Gandhi who said, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. That is certainly true on Wake Forest campus, as it is in all places of the world. But first, we must identify who they are. How do we, as a student body, treat others with a different skin tone or with a different religion? Do we acknowledge that gender and mental health hugely affect our college experience? Are our club presidents aware that not every student can pay thousands of dollars in club fees and expenses? Many students are working towards a more self-aware culture, but I would say that most of us are not. During my four years at Wake Forest, my understanding of our motto of Pro Humanitate has evolved. I've realized two things. First, Pro Humanitate is not just a guideline, but a mission. We have to actively seek out opportunities to serve and understand others because they will not fall into our laps. Sometimes that means discomfort, and it almost always means work. Secondly, our humanitarian efforts should start in self-reflection. Each one of us contains a spark of humanity, whether you're here or in rural Afghanistan or in rural Iowa. How are we acknowledging the human struggles of other students here on our own campus? By humbling ourselves, we can lift others up who deserve the same opportunities and share in common humanity. We will not always be the best at what we do, and frankly, that's okay. Instead, Wake Forest has taught me that while we should strive for excellence, we should also strive to rec recognize that excellence in others. Thank you. It's September 2013. I'm sitting at the kitchen table reading the following prompt from the Wake Forest University application. In the classic historical novel, The Sword and the Stone, Merlin tells the future King Arthur, the best thing is to learn something. That is the only thing that never fails. Later in the book, he asks Arthur, well, have you learned anything? To which Arthur replies, I've learned and been happy. Imagine it is your college commencement day. What will have transpired across the past four years to make you feel learned and happy? Whew. Talk about a thought-provoking college admissions essay. Did Wake Forest really expect us to know how the next four years of our lives would transpire? Well, of course not. But I was a high school senior with Wake Forest at the top of my list. And I had to. I just had to figure it out. So I did my research and memorized everything. Memorized the history behind our motto, Pro, -hum Pro Humanitate. Memorized statistics on the website about research and study abroad opportunities. Memorized each Wake Forest tradition. And when I felt that I knew it all, I sat down to type my essay, anxious to share what I had learned. Well, memorized with the Office of Admissions. However, it was neither my mention of how I would volunteer with Project Pumpkin, nor my anticipated participation in the annual love feast that gave me confidence about my chances at admission. No, the thing that gave me confidence was written below the essay prompt in small print. And that hint read, you may wish to consult Wake Forest Provost Emeritus Edwin Wilson's speech, The Essence of Wake Forest. So I read the transcript of the speech, and Dr. Wilson's words grabbed me. My hope for each graduate of the Wake Forest of our future is that they, if asked the question on commencement day, do you think you've learned anything, will be able to say, I truly love what Wake Forest stands for. I've made friends, I've conducted myself with honor, I've learned, and I've been happy. And I must admit that at the time, I was drawn to these remarks. They were the perfect words to conclude my essay. I confidently and proudly wrote, my experience as a Wake Forest student has exceeded even my lofty expectations. Dr. Edwin G. Wilson would be pleased to know that I have indeed learned and been happy. Now, when the Office of Admissions read my essay, one of two things probably went through their heads. One, this kid gets it. He did his homework and is familiar with our university. Let's take him. Or two, what a suck up. 
We'll take a chance on him anyway. Perhaps we'll discover in his four years what Dr. Wilson really meant in his essence of Wake Forest. Now, I'll never know for sure, but I imagine the what a suck up, we'll take a chance anyway reaction was more likely. Regardless, I'm truly thankful that admissions took a chance on me. Because today, I'm here to tell you, four years later, what I've learned about the essence of the Wake Forest I've come to know and love. And to my fellow members of the Wake Forest community here with us today, faculty, staff, students, I encourage you to also take this moment to reflect on your own unique discovery of the essence of Wake Forest. Thinking about how you might answer the question Dr. Wilson posed to the class of 2018 four years ago. Dr. Wilson's first hope for graduates was that they would come to know what Wake Forest stands for, which for me can be summed up in one word, opportunity. Opportunity was following my mentor, Dr. Tom Phillips' advice to fulfill my fine arts divisional in Venice, Italy. Opportunity was traveling abroad to conduct research twice in Nicaragua and Brazil. Opportunity was visiting opposing schools to report on the football and basketball teams for the old golden black, despite having no plans to pursue journalism long term. Opportunity is my essence of Wake Forest because in my experience, if there was something my peers wanted to do, support in the form of mentorship or funding was always available. And opportunities have come in more personal forms as well, which leads me to Dr. Wilson's second hope for graduates, a hope for friendship. I will always cherish the friendships I've made with fellow students expressed in a simple wave while passing on a quad. I will always cherish the friendships of those who have been with me since the beginning and those who have come along the way. I will always cherish the friendships of my colleagues at the Old Golden Black, where late production nights became the highlights of the week. The Wake Forest is a community where friendships are not restricted to residence halls, classrooms, or even student organizations. Being a part of the Demon Deacon community means something even more. And here's what I mean. I was a freshman when I took a job as a swim coach for an adult group practicing at Reynolds Pool. The group practiced at 5.30 a.m., three days a week, and consisted of about 25 member, members of the Winston-Salem community, two of whom you probably would not expect to befriend a then 18-year-old freshman, Vice President Penny Rue and Dean Christy Buchanan. Coaching this pair of administrators meant critiquing their technique. And I mean critiquing their technique. <laughs> it meant encouraging them helping them improve their times in the water. Experiencing the vulnerability of a pair of university administrators was refreshing. Refreshing because it taught me that at a place like Wake Forest, no member of the faculty, staff, or administration was out of reach for a given student. If a dean and a vice president of the university would allow an 18-year-old freshman to coach them, then no individual on campus was too important for another. As the pair took me under their wings, I realized Wake Forest is a place where the mentor-mentee relationship is reciprocal. Just as I coached them in swimming, they became coaches for me in their own special way. Dean Buchanan was my mentor when I, met, when I spent a month researching a nonprofit organization in Nicaragua. Dr. Rue found time to meet to discuss my own student life and the issues facing our campus community. Both genuinely cared about my growth as a student and as an individual here at Wake Forest. In other words, they became true friends, and I know each of my fellow graduates could share their own unique accounts of how faculty and staff had mentored them, supported them, and befriended them. As I returned to the essay I submitted in 2013, I wrote them thinking I knew what my four years would be like. I wrote, quoting a man we call Mr. Wake Forest for one purpose and one purpose alone, I wanted to impress an admissions committee. But now that I know Dr. Wilson more personally, I must admit, I'm embarrassed. Embarrassed to confess I referenced his speech just to impress a group of people, just to try to put a winning end on my essay. But as I stand here today, I'm proud to know I could look Dr. Wilson in the eye and answer his question in my own words. I truly love what Wake Forest stands for. I truly love and value the friends that I've made I'm truly proud I've conducted myself with honor. I've definitely learned 
grown, and discovered. But most of all, I'm grateful. Grateful that I've been happy here. Very, very happy. I hope you all can say the same. public library in my hometown is the center of everything. When I was younger, the library was in the perfect location, five minutes away from where my mom worked and five minutes away from where my dad worked. As my parents worked long hours, the building where I waited to be picked up transformed into a wonderland. I learned how to spend time in libraries. I learned how to perfect the art of playing hide and seek behind extra large copies of Where the Wild Things Are. And I learned that the heftier Junipy Jones books would bring me much closer to the Star Reader Award than my beloved picture books. And of course, I had to be the Star Reader. <laughs> the children's section of the library with its Lysol-scented whiff of, welcome back, was my impromptu after-school program and my refuge. So when my mom dropped me off for my first semester at Wake Forest and whispered, tell me what the library is like, well, I understood. I was immediately transfixed by the inner workings of ZSR. I was entranced by the way that the light of the vibrant sunrises and sunsets bounced off of every single surface in the atrium. I valued the prompt and helpful advice of Hugh Womack who always, and I mean always, seems to pop right up out of thin air any time he was needed. <laughs> In the library, I discovered a space that cultivated my curiosity without restriction. But when I stepped outside of the library, I entered another strange world. I felt the weight of this world closing in on me like the first time you lose your parents in an apartment store and you're standing, looking around, searching the aisles for a familiar face. Here, I attempted to grasp onto any sense of identity or security. Here, phantoms of a persistent struggle greeted me with scrawled words on the pavement beneath my feet. As the realities of racial discrimination permeated campus conversations, I continued to search for my understanding and my Wake Forest experience. In response to the discord ringing throughout campus, President Hatch implored our community to talk to someone with a Wake Forest experience different than your own. At first, I didn't know what to make of this statement. How could I simultaneously abandon my own comfort to reach out to a stranger? Talking to someone with a Wake Forest experience different than my own occurred haphazardly on my way to a late night study session, and yes, you called it, ZSR. The beginning of one of my greatest friendships is when Cindy Schultz, the security guard at the front entrance of the library, routinely asked to see my student ID. Cindy rode show horses. I once rode a pony for three whole minutes and begged, no, 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 begged <laughs> to be taken down. Cindy is a white woman from North Carolina who loves the great outdoors. I am a black girl from the Northeast who prefers vibrant cities. But for all of our differences, Cindy and I see ourselves in each other. I see now that I have found purpose in my friendship with Cindy and the many others who have taught me the importance of being the most authentic version of yourself. I spent much of my time here feeling what we call out of place. The challenge of finding a home in the midst of the unfamiliar terrified me. This challenge caused me to run to faculty, staff, and peers with questions of belonging. Where do you obtain it 
How do you create it? What if I never find it? I would continue to ask people all of these things without realizing the most essential part. In my inquiries, I had stumbled upon place. At Wake Forest, we are called to question this space, our time, and our narratives without passing judgment. In this Wake Forest, when it would be easier to walk away from conversations regarding racism or mental health, we meet for coffee. When opinions are in opposition with the beliefs of others, we debate. But friends, this is the balance, or rather the imbalance of it all. Feeling frightened and choosing to speak up. Feeling intimidated and deciding to listen. These are the acts that make us whole. We must learn to consider Wake Forest experiences different than our own. And today, we must ask ourselves, what is my library? What is my safety? When I stepped outside of the walls of the library, place found me in the small town of Selma, Alabama. Between sips of sweet tea and bites of buttered biscuits, a Wake alternative break trip became a community of students who longed to better understand the past to navigate the future. I have found solace written in between the lines of poetry and philosophy. I have found enlightenment in conversations about protest and advocacy. I have found place at Wake Forest. And I am certain that understanding truth and unexpected friendships will continue to find me over and over and over as they did at the front entrance of ZSR. When I tell people I have a locker in the library, they laugh. I say it's a convenient place to stash those extra layers for the indecisive North Carolina winters. My peers understand this rationale. But I remiss in telling them the true reasoning behind my locker. It's my own hideaway for the very best books. Since my freshman year, I have been renewing one of my favorites, Life Doesn't Frighten Me, a Maya Angelou poem paired with illustrations by artist Basquiat. When I am forced to return the book to the trusty stacks, the last lines of the poem still replay in my memory. I've got a magic charm that I keep up my sleeve. I can walk the ocean floor and I never have to breathe. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Not at all, not at all. Life doesn't frighten me at all. May we all set sail to our own land of Max's wild things in search of that magic charm. The Wake Forest University Chapter of Mortarboard was established in 1969. Mortarboard is a national honor society that recognizes college seniors for excellence in the areas of scholarship, leadership, and service. The Tassels Chapter of Mortarboard at Wake Forest selects the top scholars and leaders of the senior class on campus for membership. Since its establishment in 1918, a quarter of a million members have been initiated at 230 chapters across the nation. Members of Mortarboard at Wake Forest are selected to serve during their senior year, and membership signifies honor, offers challenge, and represents potential for continued commitment. This commitment extends to the ideals of scholarship, leadership, and service in the community at large. Please see the names of the mortarboard members in your program, and I ask that they stand now along with their faculty advisor, John McDonald, and the rest of you, please join me in honoring this wonderful group of seniors.
congratulations, Mortarboard. The Beta Circle of Omicron Delta Kappa, the National Leadership Honor Society, was installed at Wake Forest University on May 13, 1939. Since its founding, ODK has initiated nationally over 300,000 members. The society recognizes achievement in the following areas, scholarship, athletics, campus and community service, social and religious activities, campus government, journalism, speech, and mass media, and creative and performing arts. The purpose of the society is threefold. First, to recognize those who have achieved high standards in collegiate activities and inspire others to strive for such attainment. Second, to bring together representative students from all phases of collegiate life and thus to create an organization which helps to shape the campus on questions of local and intercollegiate interest. And third, to bring together members of the faculty and student body on the basis of mutual interest and understanding. Exemplary character is a primary consideration for membership. Let me call your attention to the names of these terrific students in your program. ODK members, along with your advisor, Bradley Chugel, please stand. And will you all join me in recognizing this wonderful group? Thank you, ODK. It is now my pleasure to recognize the student members of the Judicial Council, the Honor and Ethics Council, and the Board of Investigators and Advisors. The Judicial Council collaborates with the Office of the Dean of Students to ensure fairness and due process for all members of the undergraduate campus community. In addition to these responsibilities, the Judicial Council hears appeals resulting both from administrative and from Honor and Ethics Council hearings. The student members of the Judicial Council are appointed by the President upon recommendation of the Dean of the College. The Honor and Ethics Council is the central deliberative body in the undergraduate student judicial system. Its hearing panels are responsible for adjudicating honor code violations involving academic misconduct. We know that the honor code is central to university life. Members of the university community agree not to cheat plagiarize, deceive, or steal in all phases of academic and social life. Administrative judicial hearings address violation of the university's standards of community responsibility, as well as social honor violations. The Board of Investigators and Advisors provides students encountering the judicial process with qualified and knowledgeable student representatives, and provides the Honor and Ethics Council with full knowledge of the facts and context of a case. The overarching principle linking advisors and investigators within the judicial system is the search for truth. The Board of Investigators and Advisors selected by the Judiciary Appointments Committee. I wish to personally offer my sincere gratitude to our student members. You play vital roles within our undergraduate conduct system and I'm personally very grateful. I call your attention to the names of these students being honored today in your program. And at this time, will the student members of the Judicial Council, the Honor and Ethics Council, and the Board of Investigators and Advisors please stand and be recognized. I wish all of you much success as you continue to approach your responsibilities with a sense of respect, fairness, and integrity. Congratulations and thanks to these wonderful students. We'll now present the awards for faculty teaching, research, and service. Information about each award can be found on the awards pages of the Convocation Program. Ten of our faculty have been selected and are being recognized today. We'll recognize each award winner by asking her or him to come forward when announced. The Excellence in Advising Award recognizes outstanding advising in Wake Forest College, especially at the lower division level. We have two winners this year, while the award is for 2017. The winners are being publicly announced and honored today for the first time. The first Excellence in Advising Award is presented
to Associate Professor Alyssa Howard from the Department of German and Russian. Alyssa, please come forward to be recognized. <laughs> Students and colleagues alike affirm Professor Howard's tremendous dedication to advising and the personal care and attention she gives to each of her advisees. To a person, her advisees describe her genuine desire to get to know them as individuals and to help them to discover and explore their own interests, passions, and talents. She is welcoming, writes one, and accessible in and beyond her formal advising role. And they go on to say, as many do, that we continue to visit her and consider her a mentor even after you've selected a major and after you've left Wake Forest. The 2017 Excellence in Advising Award to Alyssa Howard. Our second Excellence in Advising Award is presented to Assistant Professor Eric C. Jones of the Department of Anthropology. Eric, would you please come forward? <laughs> Eric Jones's advisees describe him as organized, diligent, and thorough in reviewing academic progress and plans. Terms from them, ab from them abound like readily available and responsive and even in one quote, eager to help me solve problems. One advisee shared, quote, I had a pretty rough first year at Wake, and if it weren't for the support, guidance, and kindness from Dr. Jones, I would have been too discouraged to continue my schooling at Wake. Dr. Jones was not only an academic advisor, but a life advisor as well. The 2017 Excellence in Advising Award to Eric C. Jones. Our Eureka Faculty Award for Excellence in Mentorship in Research and Creative Work is presented annually to two faculty members. The Faculty Award for Excellence in Mentored Scholarship in the Sciences is presented this year to Associate Professor Awana D. Ceausescu from the Department of Physics. Awana, please come forward to be recognized. The chair who nominated Dr. Ceausescu for this award described her as, quote, the most successful mentor I have witnessed in two decades as a faculty member at Wake Forest. Juana Ceausescu has mentored 22 Wake Forest undergraduates in her nine years in the physics department, in addition to two undergraduates from other schools and three high school students. Dr. Ceausescu's students consistently receive top awards for their work. She has mentored students who have won Churchill, Gates Cambridge, Goldwater, and NSF fellowships, among others. Claire McClellan, one of Dr. Ceausescu's students wrote us and said, when I would submit a poster, proposal, or speech to her for review, she would respond, this, this looks really good, and the submission would be covered in red ink. She taught me never to accept good enough and to have my standard be excellence. For the high standards you set for your students and the energy you pour into them, the Eureka Faculty Award for Excellence in Ment Mentorship and Research and Creative Work, Joanna D. Ceausescu. The Faculty Award for Excellence in Mentored Scholarship in the Arts and Humanities is presented to Professor Jefferson Holdridge from the Department of English. Jeff, please come forward to be recognized. You can tell this is a surprise since they're all sitting in the middle. Since he arrived at Wake Forest in 2002, Professor Holdridge has worked to bring out the best in his students' writing. An expert in Irish poetry, who is also the director of Wake Forest University Press, Professor Holdridge is a remarkably encouraging mentor for students aspiring to complete honors theses. One student noted, quote, we are each trying to tie in what we want to study with something he specializes in so we can work with him. <laughs> a student who nominated Professor Holdridge wrote that he, quote, inspired me to take the poetry workshop that spurred my new creative pastime of writing my own poetry which has led to one of my poems being published. I hope it's not my last. Dr. Holdridge has also mentored many students pursuing the Richter Fellowship for independent work. 
the Eureka Faculty Award for Excellence in Mentorship and Research and Creative Work to Jefferson Holdridge. Our Award for Excellence in Research is presented annually to a member of the faculty who is an outstanding scholar at an early stage of her or his career. This year's winner is Assistant Professor Aranda Jayokrami from the Department of Psychology. Aranda, please come forward to be recognized. Aranda Jayawakrame's research is at the intersection of personality, meaning, and well-being. He's among the few psychologists whose work contributes to both psychology and philosophy. His research and theoretical developments on the topics of post-traumatic growth, intellectual humility, Rose, there's your theme, and character have received significant national and international attention, including more than $4 million of grant funding. Since arriving at Wake Forest as a postdoc fellow with the Character Project 2010, Professor Jayawakrame has published more than 50 articles and book chapters contributed to several guest-edited journal issues, and published a very well-received book in 2016. His work is highly visible and has led to his receiving the prestigious Rising Star Award from the Association for Psychological Science in 2015. As a senior colleague recently stated, Aranda is no longer a rising star, he is a star. The Award for Excellence in Research on Aranda Jayabakrami. The Donald O. Schoonmaker Faculty Award for Community Service recognizes extraordinary community service by a faculty member. This year's winner is Professor Simone M. Caron from the Department of History. Simone, please come forward to be recognized. Simone Carano is Professor of History and the incoming Chair of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department. Her record of dedicated service to the History Department, the college, and indeed the entire university, and our Winston-Salem neighbors is truly outstanding for its sustained breadth and depth. Dr. Carano has a profound and passionate dedication to community engagement, from promoting a living wage for all Wake Forest staff to mentoring junior faculty on, um, across multiple departments, guidance that has been particularly important to our women colleagues. Dr. Karan's indefatigable energy extends beyond the university to the Winston-Salem community, where she has volunteered at Samaritan Ministries Soup Kitchen for nine years, and last year added Meals on Wheels to her round of duties. Dr. Karan's attention to faculty governance, her dedication to justice inside and outside the institution, and her genu generous support of numerous individual faculty and students make her the very embodiment of my own faculty member, Donald Schoomaker's spirit. The 2018 Donald Schoonmaker Faculty Prize for Community Service to Professor Simone M. Caron. Our John Reithart Award for Distinguished Teaching recognizes an experienced member of the faculty who exemplifies the ideals of a liberal arts education this year's winner is Professor Emerita, Mary DeShazer, from the Departments of English and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. <laughs> Mary, are you here? Yes. Yes. On the X. She kept asking, why do you want me to come to this? <laughs> a student who graduated from Wake Forest more than 10 years ago writes, quote, I remember that we moved our seats into a circle for each class, the symbology of which I only now fully grasp, and had interactive and powered discussions facilitated by Mary. This was one of the only Wake Forest courses I took where everyone felt completely comfortable participating. Mary consciously created a space for her students that was safe, open, and conducive to thoughtful exploration and creativity. 
Now that I have a better appreciation for what real sisterhood is, the student goes on, I can see that Amari established just that in her classroom. Another among the many student testimonials we received, and again I quote, 15 years later, I still feel grateful every day for this experience. The mentoring and learning relationship I had with Dr. DeShazer at Wake Forest is the kind of relationship you hope you'll have with a professor when you're leafing through glossy college brochures in high school. For your matchless work as a role model and, te and teacher for countless students, faculty, and administrators, the John Reinhardt Award for Distinguished Teaching to Mary DeShazer. The Joseph Branch Excellence in Teaching Award is presented each year to a member of the School of Law who exemplifies teaching and service to the legal profession. This year's winner is Professor Richard C. Snyder of the School of Law. Dick Schneider, would you please come forward to be recognized? Professor Dick Schneider is the consummate intellectual, and his students love him for it. He has taught many classes over his two, uh, 26 years at Wake Forest, primarily on international and environmental law. But the course that students routinely describe as, quote, a gift to the law school is law and literature. He and his students read, read a dozen books over the course of the semester, delving beneath law's doctrine to be reminded at gut level that, as one student wrote, quote, laws are created applied and suffered by people. They can write in that law school. In addition to his artistry in the classroom, Professor Schneider is an exemplary associate dean for international programs. During his tenure in this position, he has simultaneously grown the ranks and increased the academic merits of our foreign-born JD and LLM students, despite drastically increased competition from other US law schools. He has also increased opportunities for our domestic JD students to study abroad, entering ex exchange agreements with schools in Italy, China, and Spain. Professor Schneider's success in this area should be no surprise, as he is a rare polyglot conversant in five foreign languages. For your unflagging dedication to the education of our students, domestic and international, the law school proudly bestows its Joseph Branch Excellence in Teaching Award on Richard C. Schneider. The Kalanick Family Omicron Delta Kappa Award recognizes an outstanding faculty member who bridges the gap between classroom and student life. This year's winner is assistant teaching professor Silvia Di Tiboni Kraft from the Department of Spanish and Italian. Silvia, please come forward to be recognized. Auguri. Sylvia Taponi Kraft joined the Wake Forest faculty in 2012 and quickly became celebrated for her dedication to her students' growth and development both in and out of the classroom. Within the five, past five years, Dr. Taponi Kraft has mentored students to receive a Richter Award Scholarship, an ACC IAC Research Fellowship, and two awards for the National American, Ital Italian American Foundation. In particular, the Richter Fellowship led to the study of Afghan and Pakistani refugees in Italy and ultimately to the development of a student organization that works to support refugee families in the Winston-Salem community and hosts an annual Wake Refugee Day. Dr. Taboni Kraft also provides ample opportunity for students to learn outside the classroom, including in her regular Italian cooking nights, programs at local elementary schools, and off-campus service opportunities. For your commitment to the robust academic life of the university, as well as the student experience, the Wake Forest Circle of Omicron Delta Kappa proudly awards the Kalnick Family Award to Sylvia Taboni Kraft. The Reed Doyle Prize for Excellence in Teaching honors a faculty member who is still in the early part 
of her or his career. This year's winner is Associate Professor E.J. Masacampo of the Department of Psychology. E.J., please come forward to be recognized. Professor routinely receives comments such as, quote, I thought I was going to hate this class, but it has turned out to be my favorite, <laughs> and is described in terms like caring, connects, considerate, and that's just the C's, and student evaluation exemplifies what it means to be a Wake Forest teacher-scholar. What may be less obvious to his students is that Dr. Masacampo's teaching effectiveness owes much to his incorporating his own and other social psychology research into his courses. For example, much research points to the importance of autonomy in learning, as well as how a sense of autonomy may be developed. His courses all employ these concepts at a deep level to get students engaged with the course material. I'll quote one student. I met Dr. M when I visited Wake as a high school junior and sat in on one of his classes. When I returned as a student to Wake, I took one of his classes my sophomore year. Three years later, he remembered me immediately. His passion for teaching and his personal interaction led me to take more psychology courses. I'm now finishing my junior year as a psych major and worked in Dr. M's lab this past semester. I love psychology and my inspiration is due to Dr. M. For your commitment to teaching and scholarship, the Reed Doyle Prize to E.J. Sacampo. We now recognize our 13th president, Nathan O. Hatch, for the presentation of the highest award presented by Wake Forest University, the Medallion of Merit. As Provost Kirsch has said, the Medallion of Merit is the university's highest award for service. The women and men who receive this honor make exceptional and significant contributions to the life of Wake Forest and have helped shape the university's direction. In your program is a list of Medallion of Merit recipients. I ask all those in attendance, please stand and be recognized for your service. Join me now as we watch a video about this year's recipient, Michael Gerald Ford. <clears throat> Wake Forest has become my home probably from the first day I walked on campus in 1968. Mike was involved in everything from athletics to the academics to the fraternity. He stayed involved in the student union. He just seemed to be kind of the perfect Wake Forest student. What I remember about his days as the consul of fraternity, he modeled uh, consistently a standard for, for personality, for integrity, for leadership that really stood out. I think what brought me back to Wake Forest professionally was I had this fond memory of how Wake Forest transformed my life. And I felt like if I could maybe go back there and bring my own expertise, my own passion to other young people, it would be very fulfilling. Well, you can see Mike's passion for the student experience in pretty much everything he's done. I think one of the most important experiences that he's probably created is the idea of philanthropy and giving back. Mike lives out our motto, Pro Humanitate. He fundamentally believes when we serve other people, we are in fact serving ourselves in the best sense of the word. His biggest contribution to the community of Wake Forest is through the Brian Bicklow Cancer Drive with Hit the Bricks and Wake and Shake, because that has just changed so many lives on Wake's campus and built leadership roles. 
We both worked on Wake and Shake together. His positive mindset and optimism was so impactful as someone who was learning, figuring out the ropes of the process. If you ever needed help, he was right there with you. He always did such a good job of keeping it real, honing it in on what everything was really about. And so to be able to be a student and just to raise over $300,000 for cancer research is just something that I don't think I ever imagined coming into college that I could do. Where Mike has really left his mark is building this whole orientation program. He always felt helping each of our students find their place was very important. He started the Deacon Camp, and so it's a pre-orientation program for first-year students. And his enthusiasm for Wake Forest just kind of shined through when he took these students to learn about the history of Wake Forest and where it actually started. And to do that with first-year students, I think is so special. And I remember when I first came to Wake, he was described to me as the president of fun because he was at the heart of all those amazing student activities that were going on. I remember Mike runs out on stage with a red wig and a white lab coat and these kind of like googly eyes and he's kind of playing this role as a mad scientist and it was so fun to watch all of the students, all of the freshmen in the audience just kind of look at each other and go, who is this guy? That moment just, I think, really speaks to his just dynamic ability to also be somebody who can meet an audience at their level. I actually didn't find out he was President Ford's son until probably about halfway through my junior year. And it was kind of shocking because he was such a humble man. I think teaching leadership to students is so important for Mike because Mike had a concept of leadership and its importance from a very young age. He uniquely understood its impacts when taught and done right. He engages students first and foremost as a conscious presence. And he also has this uncanny ability to see more in people than perhaps they see in themselves at any given moment. What stands out about Mike was how fervently he believed in students, lifting students up and giving them the opportunity to shine in leadership. Whether that is through charge, whether that was through wake and shake, whether that was through hit the bricks, those are all real hallmarks of putting students in the limelight. He didn't wait till they were seniors to help them understand what leadership meant. He really started talking to them, getting to know them, helping them get to understand what that concept was about as first year students. Mike is one of those who always put students first. So whatever the program or whatever the event, he was going to make sure not only were student voices at the table, but that if they happened not to be, that he was going to be advocating for them. As we continue to do those events, to infuse his mark of, of, of fun leadership, of letting students lead, of saying yes to their ideas, I think those are all ways that we can kind of highlight his legacy here on our campus. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of students, alumni, who are making a difference in the world. And they have all been influenced by Mike. Mike, thank you. Thank you, Mike. You have been such an incredible part of my Wake Forest experience. He's modeled for them um, what it means um, to be a person of integrity, to be a truth teller, to be a person who values service. My college experience, like so many other kids at Wake Forest, would simply not be the same without Mike Ford. His drive, his ambition, um, his leadership, his hilarious jokes. Thank you for helping shape my experience. I would thank Mike for showing me what is possible when you believe in students. Thanks so much for helping me to understand what it means to live a humble, spirit-filled life. You have been a role model, a mentor, and your friendship has meant more to me than you can possibly imagine. It's hard to think about Wake Forest 
without Mike Ford, and I think it's hard to think about Mike Ford without Wake Forest. I truly thank you for all of your hard work, all of your efforts to reach out to students and their families, and to make Wake Forest the best experience it could possibly be for Demon Deacons to come. Mike, would you join me here at the podium? I am pleased to recognize Mike, Michael Gerald Ford, Mike, as the 2018 Medallion of Merit recipient. In doing so, we honor an individual whose genuine and unwavering devotion to students and the Wake Forest community is grounded in his fundamental faith in pro humanitate guided by the core principle that we should invest our talent and resources in others. His generosity and leadership have transformed campus culture and enriched the lives of generations of students. Fifty years ago, Mike enrolled at Wake Forest. He began this love story, and he, it shaped him, and in turn, he helped shape the university. Following graduation in 1972, Mike traveled extensively throughout the country, first as a leadership consultant for the National Office of Sigma Chi, and later campaigning for his father, Gerald Ford, our 38th president. Amid the political campaigning, Mike earned a Master of Divinity degree and began his pastoral career as campus minister at the University of Pittsburgh. There he discovered his true calling was to serve not in a church, but on a college campus. In 1981, he returned to Wake Forest as director of student activities, and and the Student Union, embarking on a remarkable 36-year journey with his alma mater. He lobbied for social space for students and was largely responsible for mobilizing the task force and administrative support that led to the construction of the Benson University Center. In his mission to foster student growth and leadership development, Mike created programs and initiatives that continue to enhance life here at our university. These include Hit the Bricks, Wake and Shake, LEAD, uh, later called CHARGE, Project Pumpkin, and pre-orientations programs such as Wake World, Spark, and Deacon Camp. All of these now rich campus traditions animate and enforce our best values. Mike was called to invest in the formation of students and hundreds upon hundreds over these years can attest to the winsome power and goodness of this committed mentor. In gratitude for the many Wake Forest traditions he created that continue to enrich the student experience, for modeling his unique brand of values-driven leadership for our young women and men, and for his lifelong commitment to the spirit of pro humanitate, Wake Forest University confers its highest honor, the Medallion of Merit, on Michael Gerald Ford on this 15th day of February, 2018. Fellow Wake Foresters and friends, I'm extremely grateful and humbled to be receiving the university's 2018 Medallion of Merit. It is truly an honor and something that is beyond words 
for me as your colleague and friend. I stand before you today forever grateful to Wake Forest University, its ideals and values, its culture and ethos, its way of doing higher education, and most importantly, its people. Along with my relationship with God and my wife, Gail, and our family, Wake Forest has been the primary institution and community that has been most influential in forming me to be the person I have become these past 50 years. First, as a young adult, during my four years in college, and then as a student affairs professional, an educator, and a community volunteer. The exceptional and challenging educational and professional opportunities, the noble ideals and values grounded in our university motto, Pro Humanitate, the talented and committed people, including the many generations of our students, faculty partners, staff colleagues, have all worked together to shape my life and inspire me through these years. I'm deeply indebted to so many people for sharing this journey with me, including many of the previous Medallion of Merit recipients who encouraged and mentored me and who modeled for me the Wake Forest way. I would be remiss if I did not say I share this honor and recognition with my many friends and colleagues in student life and in the Pro Humanitate Institute who've served alongside of me at Wake Forest for all these wonderful years. They have been for me and for our students the personification of the Wake Forest way. In our modern world today, where power, possessions, and prestige are held up as the ultimate source of happiness and fulfillment, I am very grateful that we as a community of teachers, mentors, and learners have held true to the life-giving values of learning and hospitality and friendship and respect, justice, compassion, service, and love. And the greatest of these is love. This is what I've come to cherish about Wake Forest, that our shared mission has always been holistic and far-reaching in its vision our mission to engage the mind, the heart, the soul, and the body to, for young men and young women to develop them to be the very best versions of themselves for the greater good of the world and humanity. This is the Wake Forest I've come to know and love deeply deeply through each of you and through those who have gone before us and it has been my great joy and privilege to have served this unique time and place in our university's history. I've cherished the opportunity to teach and to encourage and to challenge generations of students to embrace a new way of seeing and take up a new way of doing and being engaged in the world as men and women of integrity and goodness, fueled by passion and, and purpose, who embody the spirit of pro humanitate, as all together we seek to build a more just, loving, and humane world. This is the Wake Forest way. Thank you, my dear friends and colleagues, for sharing with me in this good and holy work, for entrusting me with this special honor. May God bless each, each of you 
And may God bless Wake Forest. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Spencer Schiller. I'm the student government president for the 2017-2018 school year. Uh, on behalf of our wonderful student body, I'd like to once more thank all of our distinguished guests and award winners today. Uh, thank you as well to the students recognized today. Wake Forest University could never be as successful and unique as it is without all of your contributions, passion, and hard work. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to present to you for the first time ever the senior video for this year's graduating class of 2018. Wake Forest has largely expanded my vision. Our well-rounded liberal arts education has taught me the value of supporting the community, the importance of learning from failures, uh, and the essence of becoming a creative person. I believe that here in Wake Downtown, the combination of a new engineering program, along with our strong tradition of liberal arts, broadens Wake's holistic educational experience. House, I hope my legacy affirms former Provost Wilson's statement. I truly love what Wake Forest stands for. I have made friends, I have conducted myself with honor, I have learned, and I have been happy. We challenge ourselves to be intellectually diverse and inclusive. By doing so, Wake Forest prospers even after our footprints are left behind. What an unfathomable honor it will forever be to call Wake Forest home. Choosing to come to Wake Forest was one of the best decisions I've ever made. As an ambassador in admissions, I can help others make an informed decision. Prairie Manitate for me is to give back to the community. Uh, the mentorship and project grants has inspired me to see the potential within the younger ones. The strength of these formative relationships has truly pushed me to pay it forward. To me, Pro Humanitate is about inclusion. Learning from other cultures, backgrounds, and realizing that everyone's history intertwines. I started the Black History Month Committee because my peers and I saw a void that needed to be filled. Helping Wake transform into a better version of itself and becoming more culturally aware has been a joy. Our differences connect us. They are what we celebrate, what we share, and what bring us together. As a comedian at Wake Forest, I try to sometimes use my humor to alleviate the seriousness that can sometimes estrange us. Uh, for me, opera has always been my passion. I think pro is never only about the intellect, but also about the courage and the open mind is to become the better version of oneself. I'm glad that Wake Forest has given me the opportunity to enrich myself with both the study of economics and music. One reason I chose to play volleyball at Wake Forest is because of the culture of Pro Humanitate. As a three-time captain, I would say the most important part is to really understand each player on an individual basis, to continuously earn their respect, and to assist in their growth and development as an individual and as a player. During my time at Wake Forest, I have been able to strengthen my passions for culture and science. Being part of the Olas family represents learning from diversity and sharing my Colombian roots. My research on honeybees has allowed me to pursue my curiosity for the complexity of the brain. I feel truly blessed to be supported by Wake Forest. 
The best feeling throughout my four years at Wake Forest comes from helping others towards their dream, elevating extraordinary from ordinary with everyone around me. I spend countless hours mentoring junior students of potential, sharing ideas with visionary leaders, and empowering the global presence of our community. The excitement, the engagement, the opportunity to connect different people with their dreams. No matter the destination, it's a journey I enjoy. That's the beauty of it. I'm proud to be a Demon Deacon. In the past four years, I've encountered many great moments and also a few challenges. However, these challenges have developed me to be the person I am today. I feel fortunate and blessed to attend such a prestigious school like Wake Forest. I am thankful to play on the basketball team, and I am proud to be a Deacon for life. Thanks to those involved in producing that magnificent video, particularly the media and Mia Harris and the Office of the Provost. Following the recessional, my office is hosting a reception for the campus community in the green room straight across the quad in Ronaldo Hall. I hope you will join us there. Now let us all stand for the alma mater and continue to stand for the recessional, which will be directed by the faculty marshals. If you don't.